Hello, Wanderers. In preparation for our next Crusader Kings 3 roleplay series called The Sword and the Star, we are going to take a look at a world which some of you may be familiar with if you watched our Son of Ares series. And that is the timeline in which Alexandros and his dynasty reforged the Roman Empire under its rightful Hellenic religion. And here you can see the world as it is 50 years after Empress Ariadne formed the Roman Empire. And we're going to be taking a look at the various regions of the world with a particular focus on Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East, because that is where things have changed the most. So I'm sure many of you are quite interested. So let us dive right in. So first up, and probably most important, we are going to be talking about the reforged Roman Empire. And we're going to be looking at things from a game standpoint, but also from a kind of an alternate history standpoint. And I have made some tweaks to the scenario in the 50 years since the last season of Heir to an Empire. And some of those tweaks are going to be pretty interesting to take a look at. But first, let us see what has happened in the last 50 years for the Roman Empire. Well, who is currently ruling it? We have Basileus Iwans II. And obviously he is of the Argeus dynasty. He is just an 11 year old boy. Well, let's go back a little bit to see how we got here. Now, Empress Ariadne, as you can see here, uh, Ariadne the Honorable, she was obviously the great, great, no, great granddaughter of Alexandros here, Despot Alexandros of Crete. And she went on to forge this empire after uh, Despot Hypatios and Odysseus and Ptolemy all went and kind of built up this, this empire, this land, took the Byzantine Empire, and now that put Empress Ariadne in a position to reforge the Roman Empire under these Hellenic ideals. So if you haven't gone and watched the Son of Ares series, there are a lot of episodes, but it is probably one of the most interesting and most fun series that we have on the channel. So I would definitely go and check that out. But you don't need to have watched that in order to get some enjoyment out of this uh, episode and out of the series that we're going to be doing, Sword and Star. Uh, but yes, Basilisa Ariani did indeed reforge that Roman Empire. And you can see it's pretty big. I mean, we've got pretty much all of Italy, all of Greece, Anatolia, Egypt, and many of the islands of the Mediterranean, not to mention this a little bit of Crimea over here. So it is expanded and it has expanded a little bit even after Ariadne. So you guys all know how Ariadne's story went. If you haven't, you can definitely watch that series. But basically, she ended up taking over the Byzantine Empire. That was kind of her first step when she was young. She was the daughter of a someone from the house uh, Macedon, which obviously was ruling the empire, and then Ptolemy of Crete. So she inherited claims to the empire. She pushed those claims and she took it. And the empire thrived under her leadership. She was an incredible war leader here, an exalted warlord, as you can see, defying the strictures of her gender to go on to become one of the greatest war leaders uh, that Europe has seen in the last several hundred years, even. So, I mean, and you have to be in order to create an empire of this sheer size. So, you know, she did pretty well for herself. Once she took over the Eastern Roman Empire, she went and took over Italy as well, and that ended up with a crusade being called upon them. This was kind of a last-ditch effort by the Catholic rulers and by the Pope to halt the advance of this reforged Hellenic religion, and that crusade failed. There were some epic, epic battles. Some of the craziest battles that we've had in a Crusader Kings 3 roleplay series took place in that crusade. I think there was a battle with over 100,000 men in it at one point, which is just insane numbers. But despite the odds, despite being outnumbered 
almost two to one. At, I, I believe it was two to one or maybe even three to one at some points. Basilisa Ariani ended up winning the crusade, pushing them back, defending her lands, and then followed that up by taking Rome, deposing the Pope, crucifying him, and sending shockwaves through the entire Catholic world, which have which has had a lot of effects that we're going to take a look at once we get to looking at the other parts of Europe. But she went on and did some some incredible things. She lived n maybe 10 years after that, so she did get to see her empire settle down a little bit. She passed that empire down to her grandson, Basileus Iwans I of the Roman Empire. Now, Basileus Iwans was actually, he followed up like his grandmother. He was also an exalted warlord. And at this point, the series had completed, and we were not playing as this character this was the AI taking over at this point, and he ended up being a pretty strong ruler. He expanded the empire, not greatly, but he solidified its borders here and took over a lot of a lot of lands and really kind of just secured what his grandmother had left for him. And so he was probably fairly well looked upon. He wasn't a warmonger. You can see that he was compassionate. He was just uh, he was a little bit vengeful. Um, but he was overall a, a pretty good ruler, and he really secured this empire. Things started to go a little bit downhill after his death at 54 years of age. His eldest daughter, so he had two daughters, um, one of which has become the queen of Sweden. She's very young, only 18 years of age at this point. Um, and Princess Marquia. Now, Princess Marquia would have inherited... And uh, unfortunately, she died of illness at just 27 years of age. She died of con consumption, unfortunately. Uh, she had four children, including two sons, one of whom is a bastard, but one of whom is legitimate and did inherit the empire from his grandfather. So he had two kind of generations of grandmother to grandson and then grandfather to grandson inheriting the empire here. Now, Basileus Iwans II, uh, this is about 50 years, like I said, after Ariadne's death. He is just a young man, 11 years of age, and he comes onto the throne of the empire it, you know, in a relatively strong position, but at a difficult time. Now, he does obviously have a regent. His regent is Mayor Bosporios of Ostia. Now, this is not a good man. You can see cynical, ambitious, gregarious. He is a conniving puppet master, a genius, very handsome, and also a eunuch. So this is a man with ambition. And some of you who know history and know that uh, in oftentimes in many different historical governments, the eunuchs actually held very important positions that seemed to fade out a, a little bit in the later uh, early and later medieval age, but in this case, we have a eunuch here who is in a very, very powerful position in the empire, and he has ambitions. So the the idea of this young boy here being essentially a puppet for the puppet master here puts puts Eowans in a difficult position and puts the the empire in a difficult position. You'll see that they are actually facing a jihad, a holy war. For Egypt. So sensing the weakness of the empire after a series of very strong rulers, the Muslim lords of the Middle East have banded together and they are trying to take Egypt, which has long been in the hands of House Argeus, back. So this is their opportunity and they've probably got a pretty good chance of doing so, but the, the empire is strong. So, you know, things are probably relatively, relatively even here. I mean, not in terms of numbers, but just in terms of the strength of the empire here might be enough to match up this vast force going up against them if they had a strong leader. Unfortunately, the empire does not have a strong leader. It has a young boy and a man who is really trying to... Uh, get as much as he can for himself. So 
we'll see how all of this really plays out. But that is how things are going in the Empire right now. Now, let's take a look at some of the rest of the world. So, with the fall of the papacy, the crucifixion of the Pope, the, the Catholic religion has faced a lot of troubles. And if we go and take a look at the religion map, you can see that the Catholic religion has fallen far and it has succumbed to a lot of heresies. Now, some of these heresies are still kind of burgeoning up, but some of them have become fairly well rooted. We'll take a look at the Eastern lands uh, shortly, but first I wanna take a look at what I like to call and what I think history would call in this alternate timeline, the three good Catholic kings. And that is the king uh, or the emperor of Lyon, uh, the emperor of France, and the king of Lotharingia. Now, these are all the three most pow powerful Catholic rulers here still existing. There are a few other ones, Frisia, Wessex. Uh, those are still Catholic countries, but these are the three who are still essentially the kind of dominating forces of the Catholic religion. Now that there is no uh, papacy and there's no landed papacy, certainly. Um, so these are the the most the strongest rulers but all three of them are facing heresies within their lands to various degrees so you'll see that there is the waldensian heresy there's the cathar heresy and the lollard heresy now these all three of these are actually a little bit earlier historically than they happened in the real world but in a timeline in which the papacy fell i think it's pretty understandable that heresies would begin to start, gain ground and in some cases actually became the state religions of the nations that they formed in here. So although the founders of many of these heresies were actually born later in life and in the real world, I think the idea of these heresies popping up earlier in this timeline make a lot of sense and they would probably be led by different people and this is a representation of what could have happened had the the catholic religion fallen like that in in one of the most violent ways it probably could have and and really there was no recourse for the catholic rulers they they didn't have the strength to fend off rome for the last 60 or so years and really, they they have sunk far since then. So despite the fact that these heresies are spreading throughout their lands, the, the three good Catholic kings are still holding to their religion. We'll see if they actually manage to hold to that, but it, that remains to be seen whether or not the heresies will win out or if there will be a Catholic resurgence. You'll see that things over here in the Isles have settled out somewhat. Now we have some interesting things going on here. So we can take a look at the religion. You'll see that the Waldensian heresy has spread here a little bit and Insular is actually uh, fairly strong here as well. But the really interesting thing I think are the cultures. So we actually have an Angevin culture that has developed in Wessex. This was a French king who ended up taking over in Wessex and now has formed this uh, Angevin uh, culture here in the south of France. Then you can see that we have this Anglo-Nordic culture. It's still fairly small, but it is, you know, it's in charge of the Kingdom of Mercia, which is relatively powerful here in the Isles. So, so there is that. And then we also have the in insular Anglo-Saxon ruler here in Northumbria, uh, along with the insular Gaelic rulers here in Scotland. Then we also, of course, have the Norse Gael religion here in Ireland that has developed over time. We've still got some Cumbrian, some Cornish here, the Welsh, of course, and, and then the, the Gaelic, as you can see up here. So Overall, the Isles has settled down somewhat, but it's still an interesting place to see how things are all going to play out. Are we going to see an English kingdom formed? 
Uh, that remains to be seen. Now, as we head over to the east, that's where the religious things get pretty interesting. And you can see it's kind of a mess over here. So there is some Hellenic religion spreading. And you can see that although the Roman Empire is led by a Hellenic ruler, it is not necessarily largely Hellenic. It still has Catholic. It still has uh, Christiani. It has a large portion of Orthodox. Uh, we've got some Paulicians here as well. There's some iconoclasts just to the north in Wallachia. And culturally, and I'm kind of going back to Rome for a sec here, just so we can take a look at this. Culturally, there has been a little bit of a split here. So you can see that there is the Romaioi, which is the kind of Greek-Roman hybrid here that has formed in Italy. Uh, it's mostly kind of stuck around the Roman regions there. We have an Anatolian culture that is developed. That is a Greek Anatolian culture. We have the Cretan culture, which has developed as well. And then finally, the Alexandrian culture here in Egypt. Uh, and I believe Cypriot as well. Yeah, there we go. So we have Cypriot culture here too. Not to mention this very small Edessan culture. So yeah, things, the, the religion and the cultures in the, the Roman Empire uh, quite varied, which makes things even more difficult for that young Roman emperor. But we were looking over here at the, at the east, and you can see that Lollard has really taken over here most of the nations here. So I believe uh, Polabia and Poland and then a few of the other uh, smaller ones around here. I'm not sure exactly which ones. You can see that there's quite a mix. We've still got some Catholic. We've got some Slovianaskin, uh, Orthodox, uh, more Catholics. Uh, Sweden is a Lollard. So there's some pretty powerful Lollard kings here, mostly mostly Palabia, Poland, and Sweden. It's kind of a trifecta of a Lollard kings, and they are relatively powerful. That has kind of spread a little bit more in the east where Catholicism wasn't quite as strong at this time period. And so that has allowed these heresies to spread a little bit more here. So uh, we can see that that is pretty strong. We've still got a pretty strong uh, amount of Norse followers here in Norway, but slowly Catholicism, Lollardy, are are spreading into are spreading into Scandinavia as well. As we push further east, you can see we've still got a lot of pagans here. Uh, we've got Kuzarites, we've got Ukunusko, and you know small pockets of Orthodox, Vidilist, Asatru, Slovianaskin, kind of spreading all around here. So it's a pretty varied culture here. It's not until you get far enough here where you start to see the Tengri lands, that we start to see a little bit more of a, of a cohesive religion here. So that is, that is the East, and it's a pretty, you know, pretty interesting place. You can see that there's kind of the two very large polities here, Palabia and Poland, they're quite strong. Uh, Bohemia, Nitra, and Opalania are kind of middle powers. And then here in Southern Germany, you can see that we've got actually a very a varied, <laughs> a very varied grouping of small kind of city states and things like that. Tyrol, Augsburg, Bavaria, Austria, Linz, uh, Graz, Leibniz. All of these places are just kind of small, independent, and they are also kind of a varied religions as well. Some of them are Hellenic, some of them are Catholic, some of them are Orthodox. Some of them are Cathar. It's a it's a quite a variety here that you can see. So this is actually a pretty interesting area. Could be a very interesting area to play through. You do see that we do have this very small papacy here. And interestingly enough, this papacy is uh has a lot of the tenets of the insular religion. Now that is a kind of sect of Catholicism. And there has essentially been a kind of a peace between them after the fall of 
of Rome, there was a, I could imagine something in which the Catholic rulers were struggling to, to find a way to kind of reestablish Catholicism. And this Gaelic arch abbot here, Sylvester III, although he's not necessarily the Pope, you can see he's just the arch abbot, although he's not necessarily the Pope, he established himself as a incredibly powerful figure, not only among the insular rulers, but among the Catholic rulers as well, because there's not quite as much uh, difference between them and, say, some of these other heresies which do not recognize and did not recognize the Pope. The insular people did recognize the Pope, and so there was a little bit more crossover there. So... This archabbot has gained some lands. He was gifted these lands by Lotharingia and Francia in order to try to reestablish the kind of the head of the Catholic religion. Now, like I said, he is technically insular, but it is there is some crossover here. And so this archabbot, he's just a very you can see he's a very well learned man, and he has managed to kind of establish himself as not only the religious head of the insular, but also of the Catholics who are looking for somebody to lead them. And then Archabbot Sylvester III stepped up and he managed to he managed to do so. So that's going to put an interesting kind of position on the three good Catholic kings because they might have to make some concessions here because this guy has a lot of power among the people. And we'll see how things all play out in regards to in regards to that. But will a true Catholic papacy be reestablished or will the tenets of the insular religion start to infiltrate into the typical Catholic society? Now, as we make our way down here, we're going to take a look at the North African coast and you can see here in Iberia that the Reconquista did not necessarily get off to the, the good start that it did in our own timeline. It kind of stalled out here. There was a little bit of expansion, but it, but it really stalled out and they kind of end, ended up being in the same position as they started in. So if we look at the religion here, you can see that it is mostly Islamic religions here. In the Iberian Peninsula, it's kind of split between a few different powers, Al-Andalus being the strongest one. Then we've got a few other ones surrounding it, which are relatively strong as well. I believe that most of these are cadet branches of the, of the Umayyads, as far as I am aware. So all of these are, are Umayyad cadet branches here. So the kingdom split into these various kingdoms and now they are kind of vying for power here in the Iberian struggle. As we move a little bit further south you can see in the Maghreb there is a little bit of war going on. Things are relatively unstable in this region. There's a few kind of small polities. The Maghreb is having some difficulties here with some of its vassals. As we move a little bit further to the east, we can see we have some fairly strong rulers here in the Grand Emirate of Tahert, as well as the Aglubids, which have remained strong even since the time of Alexandros. Uh, the religion isn't really too much changed from uh, what we knew in times past, and really nor has the culture as well. We don't have any really super unique cultures appearing in North Africa or Iberia. Uh, but overall, the situation here is, is quite interesting, just in the fact that there's a lot of opportunities for any one of these powers to really develop and potentially take Iberia or take North Africa and potentially even challenge the empires of Francia, Lyon, maybe even the Roman Empire while it is weak. So that remains to be seen. And finally, as we take one last look over here, 
We're going to take a look at the Middle East, which is, as we have noted before, quite broken up into a lot of various different warring states, but they have all banded together against the Roman Empire here to try to stop the advance of the Hellenic religion deeper into the Middle East. And you can see that there are a few relatively strong ones here. We do have the Timurids, which are fairly strong. We've got the Muhammadid, the Abbasids, the Safarid, and Tahirid. All of these are relatively strong. Mesopotamia is quite strong as well. Uh, and then I believe uh, the Caliphate. If we take a, a look here at the Ashari, we can see that the Abbasids are the still managing to hold on to their position as the Caliphs. It remains to be seen whether they will retake the amount of power that they once held, but so far they have not managed to do so. Uh, finally, we're going to just take one last little look here down at southeastern Africa because there is a little bit of interesting things here. You can see Coptic religion uh, mostly spread over here. Hellenic in Egypt is, is quite strong and has been for a long time. Uh, but perhaps the most interesting thing over here is this small Greco-Nubian state here. And that is the because of despot Theoctistos who is a cadet branch of the Argeus here. So he is Greco-Nubian, and he is descended from some members of House Argeus who married into the Nubian royal family. He has ended up solidifying his position here. So this is actually a pretty, pretty cool state here, and we'll see how things turn out from there. Now the rest of the world, not really too much change. You can see India is still separated into a lot of uh, small to medium-sized states here, all fighting amongst each other. And then, of course, in the northeast and the, the, the steppes here, we have just tons of, of little states, much like we see. There's nothing that's really kind of standing out here as being particularly strong or particularly noteworthy. Not yet, but, you know, we can imagine that the Mongols might be coming within the next... 100 years or 200 years certainly so we'll you can we'll see how all of that plays out now there are many of you who may be hoping that we would go back to playing the Argeus dynasty but i think it is far more interesting to see how things play out without us directly guiding them i am very interested to see that anyways we are going to be playing a different region, which you can see when you check out that The Star and the Sword episode, which is going to be coming out very soon. So definitely keep an eye out for that. If you want to check out that episode uh, and any other series that we have here on the channel, I would highly recommend you subscribe, turn on your notifications if you want to. And if you really, really want to support the channel, you can join our Patreon or our YouTube membership and get your own custom characters into some of our future series. So I hope you enjoyed this look at the world that has come about since the time of Alexandros. Like I said, highly recommend you go and watch the Son of Ares series and all the seasons that came after that. But until our next campaign, Wanderers, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.